What's happening, everyone? Pete Pardo here from See You Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, we're going to look at the studio albums from Canadian hard rock trio, the legendary trio known as Rush. Uh, kind of doing this fairly soon after Neil Peart's passing. I uh, wanted to wait a couple weeks. I've been actually thinking about doing this one for a while, but Neil passed away. We got Everybody got involved in kind of getting over that, and I figured now's probably a good time to talk about the albums of Rush. We're specifically doing the studio albums, right? So no live albums here, no compilation albums here, no cover albums here, right? This is just the studio albums, all right? And I'm going to rank them from my least favorite all the way to my favorite. You know, I like all the Rush albums. Let's just get this out of the way first. Uh, there's really no Rush album that I do not like. Obviously, some I like a lot more than others. So, I, you know, the, the bottom, like, third, kind of tough to rank because, you know, some of those albums are a little on the spotty side, but still have a, a lot of great material on them. Okay, so even the ones that are at the bottom of the list, I don't hate them by any means. But uh, they're my least favorite for a, re for a reason, okay? The top one, you know, it was actually fairly easy to rank the kind of top half. Because, uh, again, I've been following this band for so, so long. And I know their albums so well. And, you know, and especially I grew up on all those early albums up until like the mid-80s or so. So it's like, you know what, those are going to be a little more special to me. But there's some really, really great albums that have come up or have been released from the band since that time period. And we're going to start off at the bottom of my list. Uh, easily my least favorite Rush album. Like I said, does have some strong, couple strong tracks on it. Overall, I find this not as engaging as a lot of their albums. I'm going to go with Presto being the bottom of the barrel for me for Rush. Again, some good tracks. Overall, though, just not just not top shelf Rush for me. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have folks out there who are going to say think otherwise, but hey, that's okay, right? This is what this is all about. And again, the point of this whole show and all these Rank in the Album shows is not to get hung up on the order that they come in for either me or you guys. It's just to let's talk about the albums of some of these great bands and let you guys talk about which ones are your favorites and why, or least favorites and why, right? Okay, that's what this is all about, talking about, loving, and appreciating, in this instance, Rush and their great studio albums. All right, next up for me is going to be Roll the Bones. Okay, I remember I was pretty into this album when it first came out. You know, over the years, um, I still like it. I don't love it. You know, Dreamline is great. I always kind of like the The title track is kind of neat. Uh, it's got a nice groove to it. Where's My Thing is really good. Uh, Ghost of a Chance, I like a lot. Neurotica. You know, I, I think there's some strong stuff on here, uh, but it's just not favorite Rush material. Next up, and this one could sit a little higher. Uh, I'm going to go with Vapor Trails. I think Vapor Trails has some strong material on it. This is the remixed album, which I think sounds leagues better than the original that they put out there. Uh, I just find, you know, again, with some of these latter the ones that are going to show up at the bottom of my list, I just I don't reach for them as often uh, because I think, you know, a lot of them, they have a lot of songs. I think that was one of the great things about Rush back in the day is their albums were like, you know, six, seven, eight top songs, right? Whereas a lot of the latter day stuff, you would have, you know, 10, 12, 13, or what have you. But here, you know, One Little Victory is really good. Ghost Rider is a great song. There's actually some some very strong material on here. But again, it's just, uh, I don't dislike it. It's just coming near the bottom for me. All right, hold your fire. If you would ask me this about a year ago, I probably, this might have even sat on the bottom, but I have given some of the 80s rush albums another kind of go round in over the last year or so and yeah you know what this album is not as bad as i originally thought it was it's actually some pretty strong material on here you know force 10 is obviously great time stand still some, some interesting uh and very you know produced 80 sounding rush material but not bad at all not bad at all and uh an album that's kind of grown on me. And then again, could finish a little higher here. Uh, next up, I'm going to go with uh, Snakes and Arrows. One of the, the latter releases from the band before they decided to uh, retire from recording. 
strong album but again another one of those albums that's got probably way too much material on it uh, that, that's probably if if i were to if we were to go back in time i would say to the guys you know what what do you got on here 12 13 songs trim it by a couple okay what's left is probably really really good and i but i do like that album next up i'm gonna go with test for echo again you know when this album came out i was i was i was very into it i was very into it i love the title track totem is good dog tears i don't know well produced good sounding rush album again kind of 90 sounding which is okay i think they, they wanted to go for a little bit of a heavier heavier sound here which was okay by me uh, maybe not the most memorable collection of songs ever but an enjoyable muscular album uh, like i said it's got a really good sound to it production is really good i dig it Next up, and here's one that has climbed up higher because, again, uh, going back to what I was saying about Hold Your Fire, uh, if you would ask me a year ago, Hold Your Fire and Power Windows would be languishing near the bottom. Uh, Power Windows, for me, I think has has crept up ever so slowly. You know, Manhattan Project, Marathon, The Big Money, Mystic Rhythms, Middletown Dreams, you know, some, again, very synth-dominated music, uh, some really different guitar tones from from Alex Lyson. I think that's one of the reasons that for a while, for many years, I got kind of turned off by like the mid late 90 or mid late eighties albums from Rush because Alex was just, you know, he went from having this really heavy riff dominated sound to these, you know, playing around with a lot of different chord voicings and different effects and, you know, not a lot of crunch to any of his guitar tones, but, you know, revisiting, you know, after kind of like shutting my ears off from him for so many years revisiting later on it's like yeah you know what pretty cool stuff even though a lot of synths in the, in the music i think that his kind of uh the tones he was using and the different style of guitars and amps and effects it kind of really worked and it showed what a really well-rounded guitar player he actually uh was at the time and still is obviously so power windows going next all right now i'm going to go with uh, clockwork angels their final album. If, you, if you're going to go out in style, this is the way to do it. Uh, a very strong album, I think. A lot of really good tunes on here. Caravan, the title track, The Anarchist. You know, uh, just just some really, really strong songs on here. Uh, it was great to hear him play a bunch of these live. So uh, I, I dig this album. I like it. And pretty heavy album. Pretty heavy album. Went out with a bang. Okay, next up, I'm going to go with uh, Counterparts. Uh, I've always been a fan of this album. Uh, in fact, I was just listening to this at the gym about a week or so ago and just reminding myself of uh, how much I actually do like this album. Animate Me is just fantastic. Uh, Cut to the Chase, Nobody's Hero. I mean, you know, a lot of really good anthemic Rush songs on here. Maybe not much of a proggy album, but still I think a really good hard rock album from the band with a lot of great hooks. I dig it. Uh, some great bass playing from Getty on this as on... All these albums, I'm a big fan of Getty Lee's bass playing. Which reminds me, I know so many of you guys have asked, Pete, when are you going to do that episode of your top 20 or 25 favorite bass players of all time? It's coming, guys. You know, I get, so many of you are like asking for like a million things. Like, Pete, when are you going to do a show on this? Pete, when are you going to do a show on this? Pete, when are you going to do a show on this? I don't record these these videos all day and all night, guys. You got to remember, I have a full-time job. Got a family, got all sorts of other things going on in my life. I try to squeeze this in when when I can. So you know, some of you are it's like, as soon as I post a video about a certain band, it's like, well, Pete, when are you gonna do? When are you gonna rank the albums for uh, Genesis and Saxon and Face Warning and Dream Theater and uh, Motley Crue and Molly Hatchet and Linus? It's like, guys, Jesus, chill, okay chill out i'll get to everything eventually don't have to post everything all at once right gotta that's why you got you know it's a little bit at a time you know, I'll, I'll get to a lot of this stuff don't you worry all right next up uh so what was that counterparts was last all right so we're gonna go grace under pressure a uh a really strong album a really really good collection of songs perfect snapshot of rush in the kind of like early 80s going into the mid 80s their sound is changing okay a lot of textures here it kind of started on signals but i think uh, and, and more importantly just some really really 
memorable songs on here. Again, Lifeson starting to work with all these different types of sounds. Getty experimenting with a lot of synths. You know, Neil, as always, you know, Neil goes back. I don't need to. I don't need to mention him too much because his amazing drumming is the backbone of all these albums with the exception of one. Uh, but I, I dig this. Again, this is one of those albums that I, I have liked and appreciated more as I've gotten older. Because I think, you know, back in the 80s when this came out, I liked it. I did. Uh, but I think I like it more now than I did back then. Distant Early Warning, uh, Red Sector A, The Enemy Within, The Body Electric, Between the Wheels, you know, Kid Gloves, Red Lenses. I mean, just so many great songs on here. After Image, just top to bottom, I think a really, really strong Rush album that... Uh, like I said, is is becoming more and more nearer and dearer to me as I'm getting older. And uh, Signals is up next. You know, I remember when Signals first came out. Uh, you know, because I had I saw them on this tour, and I remember all the hoopla and hype of Moving Pictures, which again was Rush moving into the 80s and starting to alter their sound from the bombast and the full-on prog and, and, and metal and heavy rock stuff of all those 70s albums. And, and Moving Pictures was kind of like a... had a lot of those tones, but was starting to bring in more accessible, okay, styles and sounds and hooks and things like that. And I think this took that to the next level. I remember originally... Because you know, if you were if you were kind of already a Rush fan before uh, Moving Pictures, but really started to get into them, then I'm talking about myself here, obviously. And then this comes out, you're kind of like, well, wait a second, yeah, these are good songs, but man, it, it's not heavy at all. Like, there's really nothing heavier, hard rocking on this album. But the songs themselves are so damn memorable and catchy. All right, and there's still enough prog going on here, but I just think that this is a collection of really great songs that saw Rush signaling to the world. We're changing a little bit, guys, but stick on the ride with us, and it's going to be fun. Okay, and that's where I think they were at at this point in time. And as you can see throughout the rest of the decade, they kind of kept refining this more modern, futuristic kind of style that had all these cool production techniques and synthesizers, different guitar sounds and styles and, and what have you. And I think, you know, looking back, way different than the 70s output, absolutely, but still really, really cool. So, you know, here, Subdivision's always been a favorite, favorite song of mine. Chemistry is great. Analog Kid, you know, Digital Man was kind of their little uh, hit from this album. That's probably one of my least favorite songs on the album, but killer, killer bass lines from Getty on there. Uh, you know, The Weapon, I mean, just... Uh, Countdown, Losing It, a, a very, very strong album that I liked a lot when it came out. Love seeing them on tour behind this, and I still really enjoy this album a lot. All right, next up, I'm going to go with their first album because I, th I still think, and still to this day, I can put on this album and absolutely love the raw aggression of the whole thing. I mean, this is, you know, very different from all their other albums, obviously, the band very much into probably, you know, Zeppelin and Sabbath and Purple and whatnot. And there's just this ferocity of this album. I mean, the, the, the crunchy guitar tones from Alex Lifeson and those like searing blues based solos and riffing and just the, you know, the, the really heavy bass grooves from Getty and that, you know, his vocals off the charts. You know, John Rutsey's just plotting drums. It all worked here. These are just really, really good heavy rock tunes with kind of a slightly bluesy edge to them. And I just, I love this album. I loved it when I first heard it. I still like it to this day. Yeah, it's different from the rest of the catalog, but I still, there's something about it. This naivety about the, the music that's just so appealing to me. And if you like early 70s, like heavy rock music, it's, I mean, this, this is it, right? It's this great hard rock, blistering hard rock, finding my way. Here again, what you're doing? Oh, working man, in the in the mood, you know, to need some love. Just wow, great, great tunes, great, great tunes. I dig it. All right, next up, gonna go fly by night. Yeah, probably could finish higher. Uh, you know what it is? All these next bunch of albums, not much separates them. So you know, this could flip flop with the next one I'm gonna mention. But you know, it's got 
perhaps my favorite Rush song of all time, Anthem. It's got By Tour and the Snow Dog. It's got, you know, Beneath, Between, Behind. It's got uh, the title track. You know, in the end, uh, it just it's just a really, really great album. Uh, Neil's first studio album with the band. Okay. And it's got one of the most amazing album covers of all time. It's a, it's a fantastic album. And again, could flip-flop at this one, but I, I really dig this album. This is like, for me, the underrated album in their entire discography. Caress of Steel. It's so epic. It's so heavy. It's complete. I mean, you, you, you talk about like the birth of progressive metal, right? You have your usual cast of suspects. Well, a lot of people will say, you know, Rainbow with Rainbow Rising and Long Live Rock and Roll. A lot of people say, you know, Sabotage by Black Sabbath, right? There's a couple other ones, you know, some uh, Demons and Wizards by Uriah Heep and maybe The Magician's Birthday and a couple others. But, you know, I for me, a lot of credit has to go to these guys, specifically this album, for kind of getting a jump start on the whole thing. Because this is heavy. It's complex, Okay, it's got epic length tunes. You know, there's no these guys were into like Genesis, King Crimson, Russian Gentle Giant for Christ's sake, right? So I, you know, I don't know. It's just it's got Bastille Day, Think I'm Going Ball, Lakeside Park, The Necromancer. The Necromancer is a totally underrated tune. The Fountain of Lamneth. I mean, just great epic length compositions that for me really work. It's dark. It's frightening. It's heavy. I just I love the just kind of like. I don't, we don't give a fuck about what the record label wants or what the Billboard charts say. We're going to make the album that we want to make, and that's what they did here. And this, to me, is one of the unsung heavy prog rock albums of the 70s. I just, I really dig it a lot. Really dig it a lot. And that's why, for me, I think it ranks just a little bit higher than uh, Fly By Night. And at times, I might even like it better than 2112. Uh, for today's purposes, I'm going to put 2112 just a little bit higher because, you know, it's got the, the epic title track suite. I mean, come on. You can't deny the impact of 2112, right? You really can't. Passage to Bangkok, you know, and uh, Something for Nothing. I mean, just some great songs on here. Great playing. Neil really, really coming into his own from a songwriting perspective. So, you know, the impact of 2112, it's, it's got to rank up there, right? Uh, next up, so what are we at? We're number uh, four, three, two, yep. So number four, I'm going to go... With permanent waves. Again, going back to talking about how when Rush in their early years were like, all right, we're going to do an album maybe 40 minutes long or a little less or a little longer, and it's going to be made up with like five, six, or seven compositions, all, you know, decent enough length, and that's it. It's like, there you have it. Deal with it, accept it, love it, right? And that's kind of what this album is like. Again, maybe their first little stab at a little bit more accessible music uh, with Spirit of Radio and Free Will. But even those tunes are like, they're, they're kind of anthems. But the rest of this album is just like, you know, Different Strings, Natural Science, Jacob's Ladder. I mean, geez, Entree New. It's like a, a, an amazingly produced album. You know, Terry Brown did so many of these albums and did a great job. Uh, the the bass work from Getty's off the charts on here. It's this killer guitar work. All right, Neil's drumming. It just uh, a, a, an awesome, awesome album that set the stage for moving pictures basically perfectly. All right, uh, but still, you know, an incredible, incredible heavy prog album from the decade that uh, I've always loved and I still do. You know, like I said, these these upper echelon Rush albums are tough to beat. Uh, next up at number three, I'm going to go with "Farewell to Kings." Uh, has another one of my favorite songs in their discography the title track okay cygnus xanadu you know all the songs on here incredible uh what i love about especially this album and permanent waves and the next album that i'm going to talk about and i talked about this on my tribute to neil show neil peart at around this time period was just doing some fantastic stuff with like chimes and and all these little like percussive instruments that would infiltrate all these heavy real proggy albums and just starting to get into using synths you know but but in a very uh you know kind of different way not like they would in the 80s right and uh of course the sun is hold on a second guys here 
All of a sudden, the sun is just blaring through my window. It's staring at me in the face. Uh, there we go. So, um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, so, uh, Neil, it's just, it, it was a really cool time in the band's history where they were just doing so much cool stuff with their music. All right, all the different guitar tones from roaring heavy stuff to deft acoustic stuff, right? The, the great lead bass lines, all right? The little bits of real proggy synths a la Yes or Genesis dropped in on occasion and Neil Peart doing this intricate heavy drumming as well as all this really gentle deft stuff. Just amazing. And, and this album and Hemispheres, my number two Rush album, I think is where they utilize kind of all this stuff to absolute perfection. Okay, these two albums easily are their probably proggiest albums. Okay, you know, you got the continuation of the Cigna storyline. Okay, you got La Villa Strangiato and the trees and circumstances. I mean, you know, it just doesn't get much better than this. It does not get much better than this. Got that great cover art. Again, the lyrics are just off the charts. All this sci-fi stuff. Um, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Now, I'm going to go with my favorite. I'm trying to... There we go. It's like, you know, where my house is, the uh, the sun sets right over the trees. That There's like wetlands across the street from me. So usually right around this time. And I would have done this earlier in the day, but I spent four hours getting new tires put on my car today on my forerunner it's like took forever so i lost like half the day there anyway uh my favorite rush album of all time you know there there's definitely some albums that i've already mentioned that might be more like kind of mind-blowing right but i think for this band anyway i have to look at the album that took me from being like a pretty excited casual fan to an absolute committed fan okay and an album that basically also took the world by storm is still beloved to this day and just again kind of ushered in a new era for the band but still had enough nods to their their early period that you can say that it, it's still a great album it still has some great songs on it and i i would be lying to myself if i put it anywhere else but number one on my list and that was be that would be moving pictures of course you know this is the album that made me a rush fanatic that's what it comes down to it i you know i was i was starting to get into the band with the couple albums that came before it i was but then this came out and i was like it this just this album took Rush into the arenas basically, and you know half this album is just really great progressive arena rock music. That's what it is. You know I never really need to hear Tom Sawyer again, but I don't discount how great of a song it is. I still like Limelight a lot. I still love Y Y Z. Okay, Witch Hunt has become my favorite song in this album. Believe it or not, Vital Signs, which used to be my least favorite song on this album. I really get into a lot nowadays. And, you know, The Camera Eye is a brilliant epic length composition. Totally proggy. Uh, great, great melodies in it. And just the instrumentation just off the charts. So that's my favorite Rush album of all time. Okay. Again, your mileage may vary. And that's totally okay because we all hear things differently. We all love what we, the albums we love differently compared to everybody else i wouldn't expect anybody to have the exact same list as mine and that's the the great thing about music is that we all interpret things differently so your chore for today your assignment for today is to go down in the comments below and list the rush albums in your order of preference and talk about why you love the albums you love so much right because that's what this whole series is all about it's not, it's not to get into the weeds of what, how we rank them, okay? Uh, because for a lot of these bands, it's hard because we have such a emotional and spiritual connection to all this music, to these bands, to these albums. So here, it's you know, I just tried to kind of make sense of all of them and say, all right, you know, if I had to choose, this is what I'm going to choose today. You could ask me in a couple months, and some of the bottom ones might change a little bit. Uh, the top one's pretty set. So let me reiterate my top countdown here. Coming in at number one, Moving Pictures. Number two, Hemispheres. Number three, A Farewell to Kings. Number four, Permanent Waves. Number five, 
21, 12. Number six, Caress of Steel. Number seven, Fly by Night. Number eight, Rush, the debut. Number nine, Signals. Number 10, Grace Under Pressure. Number 11, Counterparts. Number 12, Clockwork Angels. Number 13, Power Windows. Number 14, Test for Echo. Number 15, Snakes and Arrows. Number 16, Hold Your Fire. Number 17, Vapor Trails. Number 18, Roll the Bones. And number 19, coming at the bottom for me, Presto. Again, don't hate it by any means, but uh, it's easily my least favorite. So there you have it. The studio albums only. So if you guys are looking for, why didn't you mention the live albums? Why didn't you mention the covers albums? How about that great compilation? That's this. Uh, it's just studio albums, guys. All right. So uh, there you have it. Okay. Let's see yours down below. And visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're on the mighty YouTube all the damn time. All right. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of slowdown for a couple days. I am... Hopping on an airplane tomorrow, heading to San Antonio for business for my day job for a couple days. So you probably won't see me back with anything till Thursday or Friday. We'll see how it goes. Um, some of the things that I'm working on, more of these uh, ranking the album shows. So some of the bands that uh, I want to get to in the short term, I'm trying to think. So we got, uh, we want to do King Crimson, going to do Genesis, going to do Yes. I'm going to do like all the usual suspects, The Who, Um Joanna Blank and some of the other bands that I'm going to be working on. Fate's Warning, Dream Theater, Symphony X. I'm going to do some of the metal and prog metal stuff. Uh, what else? What else? What else? I don't know. We'll get to them all. I, I, I have a bunch on a list. And uh, The Doors. I'm going to do The Doors. Um, who else? Pete. Why can't you think? Eh, anyway, you get the point. Uh, as long as... I mean, here's here's the deal. As long as I have the full discography... And I'm pretty familiar with them. I'll do them. I've had a couple people who have asked me about a specific band. And they're like, oh, Pete, can you do this band? And I'm like, well, I'm probably not the right guy for it. Because, you know, they've got like 10 albums and I have three. And I'm really not familiar with the So, Oh, why don't you do a show anyway on just the three? I'm like, it doesn't work that way, guys. That doesn't make any sense at all. All right. It's, it's all, I'm only going to do a band and their discography if I have them all and I'm very familiar with them. All right. So there's been people have been throwing out all these like kind of, you know, bands that like I'm not, not really that into or whatever. And it's like, just do a show on, I just want you to do a show on them. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Okay. Uh, a couple of you have asked for me to do Wishbone Ash. Oof. They've got so many damn albums. Like, Jesus, I, I'd love to, but man, that's, that's, that's what, like 30 of them. How many they got? So many of them. Uh, so we'll see, but, uh, you know, the ones that have the more manageable list, obviously it's a little bit easier. Uh, like someone asked for Elton John, he's got, it's got like a million albums guys. So, uh, you know, something like this, you know, if they got like 20, maybe a couple more or less, that's pretty manageable. Once you start getting to, you know, like status quo and Rolling Stones, it's, they got so many albums guys. It's like, cause any, it, you know. It's just that's just a case of just reading off albums, and I don't want to do that because I want to be able to talk about them and do it in a manageable way, so it's not a forty-minute video, right? So, uh, anyway, I digress. So we'll have a great week, everybody. We'll see you when I get back, and uh, make sure you come visit us on the web too. Check us out on Facebook, all right? And we'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>